All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back. We are now talking about energy and work for conceptual physics. So excited to do that. All right. So the first part we're going to be talking about are the different types of mechanical energy since we've only been doing mechanical. So no explosions or anything or chemical energy. Just mechanical energy. So there's kind of the two main ones. This is one of them. Uh, this is gravitational potential energy. Let me use a different color. I'll use okay. Gravitational potential energy. This is energy that is stored through gravity. The higher something is from the zero line, the gra the more gravitational potential energy there is. So, like, what's the zero line? Uh, I, I guess I can explain here. So, zero line can be at any point. However, it's best to have the zero line at the lowest point the object will travel in. Uh, in this case, the ground. So. Yes, yeah, so in both of, in all of these cases, the lowest case is going to be the ground, but the zero point can be at any point. It's a little bit confusing, but as we do example problems, it should become a little bit more clear. Okay, so pretty much the higher something is, the more gravitational potential energy it has, and well, it also has other factors, but that's what we're going to talk about. And if you can even just imagine if you had like, um, let's say a textbook, and you drop it from one feet, uh, it's going to make a certain amount of noise. But if you got a textbook and you dropped it from 100 feet, it's going to make more noise. It's going to cause more damage. It has more energy. Okay, so the higher something is, the more gravitational potential energy it has. There's a few other factors, but yeah. So this is the formula for gravitational potential energy. Uh, it's equal to the mass times the gravity times the height. So let's use that textbook example again. So if I have a textbook and I have a certain amount, uh, it's in the air and I drop it, the more mass the textbook has, the more damage it's going to do when it hits the ground. Okay, so I guess you can kind of think of it as the damage as energy and gravity. For example, like if we're on, moon, moon, on the moon, which there's not that much gravity and I drop the same textbook, won't have that much damage. Um, because the moon doesn't have that much gravity. But if we went somewhere like, I don't know, Saturn, Jupiter, where there's a lot more gravity, it'll hit the ground a lot harder. Okay? And the same thing with the height. So we talked about the height already, but the higher it is, the more gravitational potential energy it has. Alright, so this is the main equation. Potential energy is equal to mgh. And here are the derivatives if you guys need to copy that down. Okay? Energy is measured in joules. So we'll be using this in physics. All right, moving on. Okay, first conceptual example here. Two rocks are hanging on the edge of the same cliff. Rock A has a mass of 10 kilograms and rock B has a mass of 20 kilograms. Which uh, rock has more gravitational potential energy? Remember to pause this so that you can try to figure things out on your own. Really important, even if you're getting it wrong. But the correct answer here is B. And why B? Well, remember, potential energy is equal to mgh. The gravity is the same in both scenarios, height is the same in both scenarios, but rock B has more mass. So in this case, more potential energy. Okay, moving on. Two rocks are hanging on the edge of a cliff. Rock A has a mass of 10 kilograms and it's on a 10 meter, uh, a, a, on a cliff that is 10 meters off the ground. Rock B has a mass of 20 kilograms and it's on a cliff that is 5 meters off the ground. What, which rock is, has more gravitational potential energy? So let's just kind of do each scenario so b potential energy is equal to mass b has 20 kilograms gravity is 10 and the height is 5. okay so we can figure that out. 20 times 10 200 200 times 5 uh, is a thousand a thousand joules of potential energy let's look at eight now so potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times height the mass is 10 Gravity is 10, and it's a height 10 off the ground. So this is actually also a thousand joules. 10, 100, 100 times 10 is a thousand. So both will have the same amount of potential energy. Okay, moving on. Okay, math example. A ball that has a mass of 2.2 kilograms is about to roll off the table. If the ball has 25 joules of potential energy while on the table, how high is it off the ground? Okay. So what we want to figure out is this height. And what we know is it has 
the amount of potential energy over here is equal to 25 joules. So anyway, we want to make the zero line, and that's the lowest point the object is going to be. So in this case, the, the lowest point the object is going to be is on the ground. So we have that as the zero line. Okay, so now we know potential energy is equal to mgh. We know potential energy is equal to 25. All right, what are we looking for? We're looking for a height. So uh, I'm going to divide both sides by mg, mg. And then I have potential energy divided by mg is equal to h. So let's do that. Potential energy is 25. m is 2.2. g is 10. And let's put that into my calculator here. 25 divided by 22 is equal to 1. 1.14 meters. Okay. All right, moving on. So now we talked about gravitational potential energy. Now we're going to be talking about kinetic energy. Uh, and kinetic energy, I like to think about is the energy of motion. So how fast something is moving, pretty much how fast something is moving. So energy that is dependent on the mass and speed. So I mostly want you guys to think about kinetic energy, kinetic motion, movement, stuff like that. This is the formula. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half mass times velocity squared. Uh, so this is the main formula, and these are derivatives of finding velocity and mass, if you want to copy that down. Okay, but the faster something is moving, the faster, the more energy it has. So you could think about a car going 50 miles an hour, and if it slams into something, versus a car that is going 2 miles an hour and slams into something, the one that has a lot more energy is going to do a lot more damage. You can think about it like that. Okay? So the faster something is going, the more energy it has. All right. Uh, conceptual example number three. A truck is driving at 30 meters per second carrying heavy boxes. As the truck continues to drive, one of the boxes falls off the truck. The truck continues to drive at 30 meters per second. What has happened to the truck's kinetic energy? So remember, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So in the second scenario, nothing really changes except the mass goes down. We have less mass. So if we have less mass, but the velocity stays the same, that means that the truck has less kinetic energy. Hope that makes sense. All right, moving on. Two cars are racing. Car A has twice the amount of mass compared to car B. However, car B is going twice as fast as car A. Which car has more kinetic energy? Okay, so car A, more mass, car B, more velocity. Okay, proportionally. So we know one half mv squared. So you might think, okay, if one has twice the amount of mass, A, but the other one is half the mass, but twice the amount of velocity, B, that means they'll probably have the same amount of kinetic energy. Good logic, however, not correct. Since the velocity here is squared, that means if this has twice the amount of velocity, that has a lot more of an effect than something that's not squared. Okay, so in this case, four times one. So car B has more kinetic energy because it's a square. Okay, moving on. Uh, example number two, math example. A rock is dropped from the edge of the roof. Right before it hits the ground, it is moving with a speed of 12 meters per second and has 50 joules of kinetic energy. How much mass does the rock have? Okay, so we see this rock, it's falling, and we know the kinetic energy it has at this point is 50 joules. We also know it hits the ground with a speed of 12 meters per second. Okay, so let's figure this out. We know kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. We're looking for the mass. So let's, let's do this. So we can do I'm gonna just 2 times kinetic energy divided by v squared is equal to m. Okay, so let's figure that out. 2 times kinetic energy is 50. Velocity is 12 squared. And this will give us the mass. I'm going to put that into my calculator. 100 divided by 12 squared. And we get 0 0.69 kilograms. All right, moving on. 
Uh, we're going to be talking about the last point that we're going to be talking about in this chapter, which is elastic potential energy. So elastic potential energy is energy that is stored in an object due to its momentary change in shape. So anything that kind of like you could kind of like bend it and it kind of like squeezes back like a spring, like your pen cap. Um, those things have elastic potential energy. Most things actually can bend even like I have this wooden table over here. Like wood can bend and bend back. But anyway, we're not really going to talk about that. So examples are rubber bands, clicking pens, trampolines, the springs or struts in the car, plastic rulers, etc. So when something is compressed like this, there's potential energy in it, wanting to spring back. Or when something is stretched like this, it wants to come back in and they both have elastic potential energy. Okay. All right. So here is the formula. Elastic potential energy is equal to one half the spring constant. The spring constant meaning some, the, how stiff something is. So for example, a pen cap is very easy to squeeze so it doesn't it's spring constant wouldn't be that much but your cars have springs in them so that they're not so um, so when you hit a bump or your a pothole um, it um, dulls the spring or it dulls the shock so that though is really hard to push down on your car so that spring constant would be really high and then lastly is a displacement from the equilibrium so this is like how much it has stretched or compressed. So if something has really stretched or really compressed, there's a lot more energy than something that has only stretched or compressed a little bit. Okay, so here's the formula, the main formula, and their their uh, algebraic manipulation of the different variables. Okay, let's look at some examples. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Conceptual example number five, a slingshot is loaded with a 0 0.2 kilogram pebble and pulled back three inches from its equilibrium point, meaning it stretched three inches. Okay? The equilibrium point is like the point where it's not stretched at all. So when it's relaxed, you can think of it. If the slingshot is pulled back even further, what happens to the elastic potential energy stored in the slingshot? So we know elastic potential energy is one half kx squared. So this it's first stretched three inches that's uh, the displacement but then it's going to be stretched even more if that increases that means the elastic potential energy is also going to increase okay moving on a slingshot is loaded with a 0 0.2 kilogram pebble and pulled back three inches from its equilibrium point if the same slingshot is pulled back to the same point but it's now loaded with a 0 0.5 kilogram pebble so bigger pebble. Uh, what happens to less potential energy stored in the slingshot? So okay. remember elastic potential energy is equal to one half kx squared. So just because this has more mass, mass is not part of the equation. So it doesn't really matter if something has more mass, the slingshot is going to still have the same amount of elastic potential energy. Okay, so it stays the same. Okay, mass is not part of the equation. There's no variable of mass with the elastic potential energy, so it doesn't matter. All right, I think last example for this video. Uh, a spring is stretched 0 0.05 meters from its equilibrium position. If the spring has a spring constant of 120 newton per meter, what is the elastic potential energy of the spring at that at this point? Okay, so we can imagine like the string is like relaxed right here. Usually when you see something like that, that's where it's relaxed. So this is stretched now, where it says 0 0.05 meters. So now it's stretched extra. So we want to find what elastic potential energy is. So we know elastic potential energy is equal to 1 half kx squared. Um, so now I think we could just plug this in. 1 half k is the spring constant, 120 newton per meter. And it's stretched 0 0.05 squared. So let me just put this into my calculator. 0 0.05 squared times 120 times 0.5. And we get 0 0.15 joules. Okay. 
part B. If this same spring has 40 joules of energy, how much is it either compressed or stretched? Okay, so now what we're looking for, part B, we know elastic potential energy is equal to 1 half kx squared. And now we want to look at how much it's displaced, the spring, whether it's compressed or stretched. So now let's isolate this variable. Uh, so I'm going to do 2 times epe, bring that half over, divided by k. And since this is square, we're going to do the square root. Okay. So let's put this all in. 2 times 40. Elastic uh, spring constant 120 and x. All right, I'll put that all into my calculator. 2 times 40 divided by 120, and then the square root of that. We get 0 0.82 meters. Okay, so it has more energy, so it should be stretched more. Okay, very good. All right, so that's everything. Uh, next time we're going to be talking about conservation of energy, so we're going to be mixing everything all together. So I look forward to seeing you guys with that. Thanks for watching everyone. Bye.